Welcome to the Soviet Cybernetic Economy Failure. From Soviet cybernetics to world supremacy, with a massive use of cybernetics during the 1960s forward, the Soviet Union was to become the world's number one superpower. 30 years later, the Berlin Wall fell, followed by the collapse of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, better known as the USSR. Here is an abbreviated story of what went wrong. First, a little history. Cybernetics was born in 1948 in America during the Macy Conferences as the science of communication and control in the animal and the machine. Here is a picture with some of the co-founders of cybernetics. Amazingly, cybernetics became embraced by the Soviet Socialists under Nikita Khrushchev as their favorite nation-building tool for the USSR. Cybernetics emerged as possible vector of escape from the ideological traps of Stalinism, replacing it with the computational objectivity of cybernetics. Pro and Con Two of the most distinguished cyberneticians took opposite paths regarding the USSR. Norbert Wiener visited and lectured in the USSR. John von Neumann distrusted the communists. He helped build the H-bomb and set the nuclear arms race in motion. As you may already know, cybernetics introduced the idea of information feedback as the secret behind control mechanisms with the same architecture both in nature and man-made. The Soviets extended cybernetics. In the Soviet Union, the term cybernetics encompassed not only the initial set of feedback control and information theory concepts, but the entire realm of mathematical models and computer simulations and control and communication processes in machines, living organisms, and society itself. By the time of Stalin's death in 1953, the Soviet economy resembled an exhausted beast. As a consequence of Stalin's forced collectivization of agriculture, shock industrialization, and devastations of war, the Soviet industry suffered from severe disproportions, shortages, and arbitrary pricing. The central planning system was struggling with the task of assigning production quotas to each and every economic unit and distributing the output according to the continuously revised national plan. Top-down decision-making did not provide incentives for initiative and innovation. The attempts to solve these problems by administrative measures resulted in the proliferation of centralized government agencies and the expansion of bureaucracy, further complicating the situation. A bigger mess. Soon after Stalin's death, Nikita Khrushchev, the successor, announced a bold reform aimed at a radical decentralization of economic management. A number of state committees were established in Moscow, and as a result, by 1963, the bureaucratic apparatus for managing industry not only had not been reduced, but it had almost tripled. Industrial production output steadily declined from 1959 to 1964. Then computer became a savior. By the late 1950s, the language of cybernetics acquired the aura of objectivity and truth, and computer simulation came to be viewed as a universal method of problem solving. At that time, a group of prominent economists, mathematicians, and computer specializers 
raised the possibility of using computers to improve economic management. Nikita Khrushchev was a big fan of computers. According to Gerovich, in 1961, cybernetics was going to be put in the service of communism. Computers and cybernetic models would be in use for biology, medicine, production control, transportation, and economics. The entire Soviet economy was interpreted as a complex cybernetic system which incorporates an enormous number of various interconnected control loops. And the solution was a vast computer network. A large number of regional computer centers were to collect, process, and distribute economic data for efficient planning and management. With the final goal of turning the Soviet Union into a huge economic abundance machine to create a single automated system of control for the national economy. Khrushchev, however, placed more emphasis on control than on communication. The Soviet society in general was seen as tightly controlled, organized system regulated in all its aspects. And liberal talk about freedom was seen as potentially disruptive and even harmful to this vision of well-ordered communism. The Soviet leaders had readily accepted the idea that economic problems could be solved merely by improving information flows and management techniques without any radical reform. After many twists and turns from centralization to decentralization and back again, Soviet ministers realized that information is power. By constructing specialized management information systems, Soviet industrial branch ministries laid a technical foundation for strengthening centralized control over their sovereign subordinate enterprises. Now, the ministries did not have to share information or power with any rival agency. On the contrary, each ministry could use computer technology to strengthen its own control over sensitive information. The Ministry of Metallurgy, for instance, decided what to produce, and the Ministry of Supplies decided how to distribute it. Neither will yield its power to anyone, explained one official. Having different ministries is like having many different governments. By contrast, in the USA, the government supported new technologies, new uses were stimulated by private companies, which took advantage of the reinvention of the computer first as a business machine and later as a communication device. So, the Soviet effort to apply cybernetics to the economy was a long string of blunders. In the end, the result was that they transformed the original concept of a national network into a patchwork of ministry-subordinated data banks. Complexity thwarted the machine. Too many errors appeared everywhere. They tried their best. At one point, they even tried to re-engineer the entire Soviet bureaucracy. For instance, to develop a detailed design of the workday and the work week for every bureaucrat. 
to create detailed lists of their duties, and so on. The OGAS project, a modernization project, had direct political implications, which threatened to upset the established balance of power. The grandiose plans of Soviet cyberneticians to reach optimal planning and management of the national economy by building a nationwide network of computer centers never came to fruition. Cyberneticians in the Soviet Union aspired to reform the government with a technological tool whose uses the government itself defined. These resulted quite naturally in a transformation of the tool itself from a vehicle of reform into a pillar of the status quo. It seems Cybersyn had a chance. Nerovich recognizes that a nationwide management system, any individual part of which was not viable, could not be viable itself. On a smaller scale, he says, this vision was implemented in Allende's Chile, where the British cybernetician Stafford Beer designed Cybersyn, a national system of automated economic management. Cybersyn was supposed to provide maximum autonomy to individual enterprises within the overall planning system. The Soviet Internet. Why did it fail? Well, Wiener's cybernetics was more mechanistic oriented. This fit the Marxist reductionist model of society and the economy, but they could never plan production correctly. It was far too complex. The Russians did not follow the progress of cybernetics into Ross Ashby's explanations. They never realized the importance of Ashby's Law. And thirdly, obviously they did not try to learn from the Chilean Cybersyn project. They never took into account that information is a product of the economic system as it is working, not the other way around. Although they recognized the importance of feedback, they were prone not to recognize mistakes. They never learned. Politics also interfered with technical decisions. Cooperation and commitment was absent. Politicians were playing a lose-lose game. Number seven, contrary to nature's use of cybernetics, the Soviets were trying to build from the top down instead of from the bottom up. Number eight, economic models, even dynamic ones, are no panacea. The lag time between information from the output and the feedback of the error signal can be deadly. And last, in a chaotic world, a small difference can generate a huge difference. Now to a curious note. The Macintosh beat socialism. Thank you, Steve Jobs. The unexpected hero against socialism in the Soviet Union turned out to be the Apple Macintosh personal computer. Activists in Moscow used it to publish news about the downfall of communism and get the people going. And Mikhail Gorbachev used a Macintosh to write his papers on glasnost, which means transparency, and perestroika, reform, the step necessary to derogate socialism in the Soviet Union. Thank you for watching.